All right, so my name is Gavin Keneally. I'm one of the co-founders of Ghost Robotics. So what I want to talk to you about today is really legged robots, so robots that use legs to move around instead of wheels or tracks. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the challenges, the applications, and commercialization. So really it's, you know, this technology uh, seems like it's around, but why are there no legged robots kind of in our day-to-day -day lives yet? So the, the first biggest challenge with legged robots is that there are lots of joints. So we call these degrees of freedom, or active degrees of freedom. So basically what this is, is on a person or an animal, it's your, your muscles, you can kind of move around your joints. Uh, in robotics, it's really where do you have a motor, a motor controller, a gearbox, whatever other linkage you need. Um, when wheeled robots or wheeled and tracked robots on the right, you can see that really, uh, you know, as in a car, you can go forward, you can turn, you can go backwards, and that's about all the mobility you have. So that means really you only need uh, two degrees of freedom, so two motors. So it's really kind of skid steer, you can either go forward or turn. Um, here on the left, I have a representative legged machine, and it's a fairly simple, fairly low degrees of freedom, but still it needs 12 motors to be able to walk around well. So as you can imagine, there's lots of expense and complexity associated with having this many little subsystems in the robot, but also there are really significant challenges in terms of coordination and balance, right? With a wheeled system, if you turn off all the power, it'll sit there perfectly happy. With a legged system, if you turn off, we have some goats. Oh, thank you. Or you mentioned goats, they're on the uh, 80 degree uh, rock face. I'll play that again. And they're able to, they're actually looking for the salt, and they're trying to lick the salt on the side of this uh, rock face. But they're able to walk, you know, these incredible, incredibly steep surfaces, and they're able to really get their feet into the asperities to be able to move around. So there's really, you know, if you're able to harness the power of legs, you're really able to have, you know, spectacular mobility. Um, there are also a lot of fundamental hardware challenges here. So just as a prototypical high-performance car, I've been comparing the uh, Tesla Model S, the P90D, to uh, you know, one of the legged robots that we're working on right now. And I've just looked at some of the kind of measures of uh, power and torque in the machine. So if you think about the specific joint torque, so that's how much torque uh, normalized by the mass of the machine. So the torque is what gives you all the acceleration in the Tesla. If you've ever driven in one of these, there's a lot of torque. Um, but even so, in a legged device, just because of the morphology, you need about four times the torque uh, for good performance. Um, again, if you look at specific peak power, so this is the power of the machine normalized by the weight. Uh, we have about five times that of a Tesla. Uh, the specific energy is, is pretty similar. Um, and then another really interesting point is the control frequencies. So this is how quickly uh, is the control loop actually happening, uh, how quickly are you able to control the motors Cars, uh, all drive-by-wire in cars happens 100 hertz, so 100 times per second, whereas we're operating the robot uh, at 1,000 hertz. So that means 1,000 times a second, we get feedback from the motors, uh, and we give commands to do all of the uh, balance and coordination that's required for locomotion. So a lot of our inspiration comes from biology. Here's a great example. So here, I'd like you to focus on, really, look at the, what the dog's legs are doing when they hit the ground. So you can see there's all kinds of deflection happening in the legs. Really, there's a lot of springiness. Uh, you know, the pads on the feet are able to, to sense the contact with the ground. And you know, the dog, so the dog is very aware every time it touches the ground. But it's really managing the kind of compliance and impedance uh, at every step. So it's pushing with just the right force. It's just the right springiness so that it's able to coordinate and balance and you know, run so gracefully. Uh, what we did, uh, typically, so. Typically, you know, in legged machines, you have the same kinds of challenges. Anytime you have these contact forces, you need to manage the, the, the stiffness. Um, so typically, this happens with mechanical springs, or you have hydraulics or pneumatics. Uh, what we did is we actually switched it from hardware to software. So here's an example of our research robot running around. Um, you can see a lot of the same very springy behavior that you kind of see in animals as the, the robot bounds along. Uh, but there's actually no hardware springs anywhere in this machine. Uh, this is all happening through the motors in software. Um, so we've really you know, removed a lot of the complexity uh, in the hardware, and we're using the motors themselves to feel every time the leg hits the ground and to, to pretend to be you know, these kind of uh, virtual springs. 
Also, the designs are, are very modular, so each of these degrees of freedom is, is kind of a standalone uh, device that we've built. The control of the robot is also uh, biologically inspired. So we're, one of our collaborators is a biologist at UC Berkeley, and his great observation was if you run animals over a force plate, um, the force profile, so kind of the force over time for six-legged animals like a cockroach, uh, two-legged animals like us, or even four-legged animals like a dog, it all looks very similar and it really uh, can be represented by a really simple underlying model, which is basically a pogo stick. So the force profile is incredibly simple, um, and so the control of our robots use these kinds of really simple templates uh, instead of having to do very advanced calculations for all the coordination and balance. So it's computationally very effective, and this turns out to be very, a very robust way to do control. So I'm just gonna let this video play. Uh, here's an example of the research version of our robot moving around uh, in the environment. You'll note that there's lots of unstructured terrain, uh, you know, lots of, lots of slippery surfaces and hills. Uh, there's even some jumping involved. So this is a, a walking gait. So if you look carefully, you can see that the diagonally opposed legs are synchronized. Again, so the robot ha has, you know, it's walking at this point completely blind. It has no sense of the environment. Um, somebody is driving it around with a joystick, but all of the, you know, really complex mechanical interactions between the legs and the rocks, uh, this is all happening very reactively. So these simple models are really letting the robot do the right thing as it goes over this very unstructured terrain. Um, another nice thing about legs is you're able to, to really direct the forces that you exert on the ground. So if you're not able to walk over an obstacle, you can always try and jump. Um, here we can walk over this curb. So again, the robot doesn't know the curb is there. Curb is there. Uh, it just is walking in such a reactive way that it'll naturally kind of take the right steps to get over the curb. Obviously, we're also able to walk at different heights. So we can, you can imagine, you know, I'm gonna talk about the applications towards the end, but I'm sure you can imagine there's some provocative kind of inspection tasks uh, that are pretty obvious from, from these videos. Um, of course, it's also uh, a big challenge for us to have the robots be able to work uh, not only in, in different weather, but in the terrain that's caused by the, the winter, for example. So here it is walking on ice, and you can see that while it does kind of fall a little bit, it's able to recover. It actually very naturally tends to take more steps as it starts slipping, kind of like we might. Uh, and this isn't something that's hard-coded, it just comes out of the, uh, the simple reactive controller based on these simple models. The payload on the research version of the robot is uh, fairly limited, so here you see it only carrying five pounds. Uh, this was an, a demonstration, so the, the bandwidth on the, on the legs is very high, so we're able to do things like, even though it only has uh, four motors at that point, uh, it can walk on two legs for a few steps. If it had more motors, that would be much easier. Um, and then here's a bit of a coordination between a larger prototype we were working on at the time and the smaller one. I'll get into the larger robot a bit more in a minute. Um, here we have the robot playing a version of the knife game where it's kind of demonstrating that it can really quickly move between my hands, but as soon as I put my finger in the way, it's able to sense the force and stop immediately. Um, another real innovation for us, so we've not only drastically simplified the hardware that's required, so we've gotten the, the complexity and the cost associated with that down, but also we really believe that software is the real innovation. So it's one thing to have a robot that's really capable of moving around in a, you know, really diverse terrain, but you also need to be able to have the application engineers interfacing through an SDK. So this is you know, a, quite a complicated diagram. The idea here is we, there is an SDK, you can have uh, an interface through the robot at a very high level and just kind of drive it around as you might a wheeled vehicle, or you can have a lower level interface if you want to do something special uh, that actually requires you to be able to control an individual leg. So for example, if you wanted to press an elevator button, you could have uh, you know, low enough level control to command the leg and press a button. 
So this is the, I've been showing you the research version of our robot. We actually, here's a really preliminary video of our next generation prototype, which we'll be shipping early next year. Uh, this robot is uh, about 50% longer. It has 12 motors instead of eight. So it's able to do uh, kind of much more, uh, you know, dynamic maneuvers. It's really able to contort itself around. Um, and the endurance of this machine is significantly higher. So this robot uh, in mixed use will be able to operate for about six hours. So much more than anything you'd get out of a drone. Then finally, the real magic comes when you start to integrate robots like this that are able to move around in unstructured settings and walk upstairs, uh, you know, open doors, all these kinds of things, and interface this with sensors. So these could be visible light sensors, uh, it could be thermal, it could be um, uh, night vision, and really think about now moving these sensors around in an environment uh, autonomously, but with enough endurance to actually do some real work. So the, the most obvious example of this, of an application here, would be uh, in exploration. So you can imagine, you know, if there was a, a mine collapse uh, and you needed to, to, you know, put a robot in the place of a person to do some exploration with some sensors and see what's going on, you can keep the people out of a dangerous environment. Um, obviously, there are lots of applications in military as well, where you'd like to send the robot ahead and, you know, get a good vantage point to look around the corner. And then what we're really excited about is uh, in industrial settings where you really just need to do either security or asset management. So you can have the sensors that you need on the robot and the robot can just be going out into its environment, moving over the difficult terrain um, and moving around either uh, from waypoint to waypoint or even with a geofence and it's collecting all the data that's relevant for uh, you know, the security or asset management. Uh, and then at the end of its you know, six hour shift, it can just autonomously return to uh, a charging station and charge and another robot can take its place. So we really see a lot of, of opportunity here to gather lots and lots of data uh, around a plant or uh, a factory or any kind of environment where you're interested in the, the securing the perimeter, gathering this, this data with the robot and then reporting it back to the command station. All right, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to questions. Yes, go ahead. Actually, I... Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, this is the conch. So you right. hold, hold, hold on a second. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay. You suggested that your leg control system is based instead of a mechanical system, essentially on what looks like a sort of servo-based system. You're, at, you're modulating power to essentially both trap feedback and actuate. You deliver mechanical energy. Right. That system, is there a substantial power trade-off over time compared to a conventional mechanical system and, and is that sort of extrapolated or factored into the way either battery life is going or the product design? Yeah, so what we've really done is have the motors be much more back drivable um, so that they're able to, uh, you know, be deformed by the environment and capture that information as you've said and then kind of be a, a virtual spring. Um, really we're able to shave a lot, a lot of weight off the device by not having all the mechanics and because it's a smaller gear ratio there's much less friction in the gearbox. So from what we've seen, uh, either the energetics are kind of a wash, or it's actually a slight advantage to have this much more simplified design. So your motor and off the shelf. Right? It is, yeah. It's all uh, our actuator is completely custom. So the the motor, uh, the gearbox integrated inside, and the motor controller is, is all custom. Hello. Yeah. Uh, the um, all the applications that you showed at the end. So the idea that you, is this a little bit like an iPhone and app model that you, that you guys are building, where you have the hardware and the OS, but those people will be independent software developers will be building the applications. Right. So I think that's a great way for us to scale. Uh, more immediately, we're really focused on doing some pilot programs ourselves. So we're in talks now 
Uh, we're gonna release the robot at the beginning of 2018, uh, and then we have pilots scheduled actually throughout the year. So we wanna both be validating the, these business cases ourselves with some, some critical pilots with partners, uh, and then as we kind of mature, we'd like to open things up more and more and more and more so it can really be more of an app model, yeah. And uh, what's, what's the state of uh, openness of the industry to all of this? Are you very much in evangelization mode still, or are people uh, opening up to the idea? Yeah, I mean, so wheeled security robots, uh, you know, there, there are a few examples of those uh, right now that are, that are being deployed in pilot stages. So I think people are really understanding, uh, you know, that this is an industry that's really ripe for automation. Uh, so a lot of those are, are either wheel-based or drone-based. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's happening right now, and I would expect that to, to scale up pretty significantly um, over the next year or so. But what we're really trying to capture is being a, a much more comprehensive solution where we could partner, let's say, with a drone company and with a, you know, a, a larger sensor company um, and really do a, an integrated solution to really just gather all the data that's needed from the perimeter, really as a kind of a mobile IoT platform, and then just bring it all back to the command station for people to make decisions. Thanks. Can you tell us something about the mass production, where you plan to, to actually produce these and the uh, challenges that you found uh, in your outlook going forward? Yeah, so we've actually been selling the, uh, the research versions of these robots for the last year. So we've had some validation there. Uh, you know, Google's bought a few of our robots, as have a number of top research universities. So we've been making them. Uh, we've been doing the assembly locally, uh, but we have a, already a pretty wide network of suppliers who do the subcomponents. So our strategy is really have the suppliers who are doing the subcomponents do more and more uh, of the assembly of the robot, but we, at least we would like to, at least for the next year or so, uh, through our seed funding, we'd like to still be able to assemble them in-house and do all the quality assurance. But we've really, I mean, compared to other devices that are this complicated, the part count has really gone down quite a bit because of our really simplified mechanical approach and really moving the complexity to software. So the su yeah, supplier network is, is all over the globe, but yeah, the final assembly and, and testing and quality assurance is, yeah, is happening in our offices right now. Um, for a drone that is basically a sensor system, if you're not operating underground or you're not sensing the ground that you're walking on, what are the perceived advantages versus a flying drone, which is obviously faster and has a height advantage? Right. So yeah, I think there, there are a couple. The, the most uh, stark difference is really the endurance. So drones, you know, right now you're getting about 20 minutes of battery life typically, uh, and for our new robot in mixed operation, the robot can be out and moving around for about six hours. So if you really want to be able to do, you know, something that's approaching, you know, a, an eight-hour shift, you know, we're, we're getting pretty close to that. Um, but also there is a noise issue, right? Drones are also, you know, quite loud. Um, whereas because there's very little kind of mechanically that's going on with our robot, um, there's no sound unfortunately, but it's fairly quiet. Um, and then finally, we're able to, to exert forces on the environment. So this is something that's a little bit more subtle, but you can imagine, you know, if you're moving around inside a building um, and a drone needs to open a door, I'm not quite sure how that would happen. It seems unlikely. Whereas because we have all these degrees of freedom in the legs that we use for locomotion, we can also do a fair amount of manipulation with the legs as well. So whether it's pushing a button in an elevator or opening a door, you know, all of that is really just a, a, a software update away. You know, the hardware is all there. Uh, it, the, the complexity is really just in the software uh, from the perception and a manipulation standpoint to be able to do those kinds of things. Help, help us maybe contrast, um, you know, compared to a, a Boston Dynamics or others, this, this, this whole renewal of legged robotics. Is, is everybody going in the same direction or are there drastic differences in terms of approaches and technologies? Yeah, I mean, I think Boston Dynamics has done a, a fantastic job at kind of building the best legged robots that they can, which really reflects their background um, as, you know, uh, really a, a kind of a research company. They're, they aren't particularly commercially focused. They design really nice hardware. But the, you know, the, the part count and the mechanical complexity and the cost uh, is, is very significant. So we really are focused on kind of bringing the, the complexity and cost down as low as possible so that we can start piloting these machines. So I see that's kind of 
from a you know, company mentality perspective, uh, that's really the biggest difference. Um, and then we're also able to, to scale the platform up and down. So all the Boston Dynamics robots uh, are quite a bit larger because they, they were funded until very recently exclusively by the military uh, for things like being pack mules. So they're, they're very large robots that used to be very loud, uh, whereas we're interested much more in the kind of industrial sector. Yes, hi. Um, I'm a software developer myself, so um, I'm intrigued by your approach of having software-only joints. Uh, does it give you an advantage in terms of uh, hazard detection? Like, let's say if your robot is about to approach a quicksand, I mean, is that uh, also, finally, um, what happens it ends up in on, its, on its back? Yeah. So the, I'll answer uh, the second question first. So the robot can actually work inverted. Um, so I didn't show it in this video, but you can flip the robot over and it can just keep walking. Um, that was really one of our design focuses was to have a really large workspace for the legs. So it actually doesn't matter if it gets flipped on its back. And then from a hazard identification, I think there's a kind of a hierarchical structure where you know, we're adding stereo cameras for perception. So as much as you're, you'll be able to kind of sense of your environment through extra reception, you can kind of see what's going on, and then because you can feel through the legs, you can also feel the lack of traction. So as it did in the, in the ice. Does it give you an advantage over other I mean, it's an advantage in that you know that the leg is starting to slip, and you can correct it before the robot falls over. So yeah, I'd say that's, a, that's a pretty significant. Um, that's a, really a lot of what you saw in the, in the ice, right? It, it sensed that it was slipping, and so it made very minute corrections. Great. On this note, thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. Good.